And then Matthew, you're gonna you're gonna start off with the um with the slides when we get going, right? Great, right, yeah. Perfect. I'm ready to screen share when you no um we're st still waiting for Dr. Well, we don't have to, yeah, we can get her in as soon as she um is able to get on, Dr. Herrera. Okay. Okay, I don't I don't think she's uh been at a, as a panelist, so I just need her we need to put her email address in there then. That might be the reason why she's I, I yeah, I did send it, so I think she should. Oh uh yeah, I think she should have it. I don't see her. <laughs> if you send me her email address, I think you must have put it somewhere else, Matthew. I don't. I don't okay, let, let me. Uh... I think... well, welcome, everybody. Sorry, this is the usual uh, technical preparations for uh, Prism Rounds. Great to see everyone back here. Okay, let me put it in the chat again. And then let's see. That's just going to panel. So it's like, there we go. Perfect. Okay, I'll just, I'll just put it in right now. Ravi Gold has arrived. Well, that's good. Oh, look at that, Dr. Elder. You got a nice drink for yourself. That's pretty nice. Are you gonna, are you gonna tell us what you're, what you're having there, or is it gonna be a secret? Very good service here. Right. <laughs> It'll be a secret. We got, we got, we got to learn from that. <laughs> and those, those of you joining, great to hear uh, where you're coming from. Always nice to, uh, to see where people are calling in or, 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 or zooming in. So please uh, let us know where you're calling in from, and we'll, we will get ready in just another minute or so. Good stuff. Did you did oh, you get Dr. Herrera? Is from Ireland. We got some. We got we got a friend from Ireland who is who has been here. So that's great to see him back here. Great. Turned it out Tobago. Fantastic. Hey oh. Zach. Hi. You got some. You got some of your Pittsburgh peeps again yeah. here. Expect to Toronto. Good. Pittsburgh. I'm glad Toronto's representing. Yeah. That's important. Super, right. I think, so we're, we're ready to go. Okay, good stuff. Yeah, do you wanna uh, turn over and I'll do a screen share here. Yeah, I'll let you screen share, but I wanna welcome everybody uh, back to Prism Eye Rounds. We've been doing this now since uh, the COVID pandemic struck. Uh, we've been doing them, of course, now a little bit less regularly. Manash Shah from Karachi, Pakistan. What time is it in Pakistan right now? That's fantastic to see that. Emma from Chicago, great. 5 a.m. It's 5 a.m. In, in Karachi. So that's fantastic to see you here, man. Uh, thank you. Santa Cruz, Bolivia. So Dr. Eller, we've got a pretty international crew to see your, see your group. Pittsburgh's in I'm the house. Pittsburgh's representing. Yeah, Dr. Rare is saying she managed to connect, but she may not be a panelist. So we may have to look for her and upgrade her. Okay, I, we will look for that. But let me, let me get the ball rolling. We yeah. have a, a special um, uh, rounds today, and this is a special Pittsburgh edition. Um, funny enough, I actually applied to Pittsburgh as, and, and uh, you know, Deep Dollywell will remember that interview I had actually there and I was vacillating between cornea and glaucoma. I ended up doing glaucoma, but I was really impressed with the program. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what, what would have happened if I ended up in, uh, in Oakland, Pittsburgh, which is where Pitt is, right? I even know that. Um, so I'll, I'll let uh, Matthew get started. Matthew is one of our fellows. He's been helping organize rounds. Matthew had a great day in the OR today um doing a bunch of uh you know tough glaucoma cases some migs some blebs some some cataracts so good way to start the day and now a great way to end the day with rounds so i'm going to get you to to share um your screen there just to introduce uh our speakers we got we got uh lee montan from malaysia here so really nice to see a, a nice diverse group and a pleasure to get everybody here please give us some feedback about what topics you're interested in we got some a bit of a flavor here matthew are you able to share your screen uh, sure I am. Um, we have Maria Rera, Dr. Maria Rera on there on the chat list. So if you want to upgrade her, can you do that? Yep, I'll do that. I'll do that for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds yep. good. Okay, I'll share my screen in the meantime. Yeah, I also see Colin Prensky here. I'm not sure if he awesome. wants to upgrade now or just before the second case. No, we'll get him. We'll get him up. I'll make you I made okay, you cool. co-host, uh, Matthew, so you can. Oh, cool. oh great. I made, Thanks. I made Ricky co-host too, if you want to find them. And okay. Yeah. We can talk about I think everybody co-hosts. Why not? <laughs> Fun for all. All right, let's see here. We got our messaging app in front of you here. <laughs> Be careful what you go. show there. Oh, true, true. Let me get that off. As part of our fellowship, we use an app called Slack. And a lot okay. of people use Slack. It's a really great messaging app, kind of an all-in-one solution. And we message all the time on clinical questions, research, admin stuff it's kind of become a, a staple a bit of an annoyance for our fellows probably i'll say but it certainly keeps everyone in touch so no it works really well 
All right. Thanks, guys. So, um, Ricky, huge shout out to you. Um, she's been messaging me back and forth about Prism Rounds for ages and saying, you know, how much she enjoys them and here are all these great ideas for stuff we can do. And it got to the point where she, where she was like, well, here are the panelists, here are the speakers, here are the topics. And I said, take it away. Let's let's do a combined effort here. Um, is that Colin who just joined? Yeah, How's it going? And there's Dr. Rare as well. Awesome. The gang's all oh, here. Great. Okay, good stuff. So we're all here. Sorry about the delay a little bit there. Um, so anyway, my name is Matt Brink. I'm one of Dr. Ahmed's current fellows. So just helping out with these rounds. Um, and again, thanks to Ricky. We've got our panelists here, Jamie Auden. Um, so we'll introduce a little, a little blurb on each of you guys. But um, Ricky Enzor, Dr. Marie Herrera, and Dr. Eller. Uh, and from the Pitt Retina Service. So this is going to be a retina themed um, discussion. Um, so Jamie Auden uh, is uh, MD, uh, MPH from University of North Dakota School of Medicine and then Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, uh, UPMC for Ophthalmology um, and future aspiring retina fellow. Um, Ricky, uh, we met during interviews for um, glaucoma. So, um, you know, we've known each other since then. Um, MD, PhD, Indiana University med student, um, UPMC ophthalmology residency, and then VOLD um, anterior segment fellowship, and going to Indiana for more glaucoma fellowship um, next year. Um, Dr. Eller, uh, Will's Eye Ophthalmology Residency, Retina Associates, Mass Eye and Ear and Vitro Retinal Fellowship. And now the Retina Ser uh, Service Director of Ophthalmic Trauma, UPMC Eye Center, and Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Pis Pittsburgh. Thanks for joining us. And Dr. Herrera, MD, PhD, uh, Sorbonne University uh, Residency in Paris, France. And then Moorfields Retina, Uveitis, and Vitro Retinal Fellowships in London. Um, and then again, Moorfields Teaching Fellowship. And then the Director of uh, Uveitis Service now at UPMC um, and Retina. Um, and thanks again for joining us, guys. We got a yeah. star study crew just, here. Yeah, let so me just chime in for a moment. We we don't have Dr. Prensky on our slide, but uh, Colin Prensky is a young uh, younger retina faculty in Pittsburgh. He was a resident in Pittsburgh, um, did his vitreo retinal fellowship at Cornell, and is now back on the faculty at Pittsburgh. And actually, he is um, someone who does a lot of our complex anterior segment type cases. So um, he does combined cases with Ian Connor, who I think some of you guys know, uh, as well as does a lot of his own Iowa work. So, you know, I had the privilege of getting to sit in on some of those cases with him when I was back in Pittsburgh. Had a whole lot of fun together. I think awesome. Colin's supposed to be the secret weapon here. He's supposed to be like the secret guy coming from the side just to fly <laughs> <everybody. laughs> Sneaking in there. All right. So um, I do you I'm mind? Glad, I'm, glad um, to meet, I'm glad to meet the people that save, save Ian's butt. That's good to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you um, give Ricky uh, screen sharing? Yeah, let me let me just see. Okay. Let's bring up. I think this is what we want here. Let's see if I can. Okay. Uh, how does that look? Maybe I need to reverse. You, you've got the same problem I had. You have multiple. Yeah. Screens. Here, let me get rid of the other screen and see if that fixes this. Um, yeah. There what, we go. what you can do okay. is you can drag the this screen to the other. That's I'm just okay. Gonna switch. Yeah, I'm good. All right. So, um, hey guys, it's a privilege to be with you guys tonight. I'm Ricky. Uh, as you guys already know, you've met our panelists. Um, in light of Halloween coming up, Dr. Auden and I wanted to present some scary cases for your enjoyment this evening. The first segment of the evening is titled Eyes on Fire. This is a case um, from when I was a resident in Pittsburgh. And just a quick Spoiler alert, in spite of the title, this presentation is not about the popular dub, dubstep remix of a Danish pop song. Rather, in this presentation, we are going to be considering some retina cases. And actually, by the way, the first of the cases that we are going to talk about tonight describes one of my greatest fears as an anterior segment specialist. Tonight's first case is about a lovely senior lady being seen in the community by her local comprehensive ophthalmologist. The backstory is, uh, someone's trying to call I think me. Your, your slides are not advancing. Uh, okay, so how do I? Um, why don't, you, why don't you stop screen sharing for a second? Stop screen share, okay. Okay, that's fine. Let's try again. 
And then what you can do is select the screen that has the, pre the, the presentation, not the presenter view. That okay, should How work. do I do that? And like, because I only have one screen. Share, start your screen share again. Okay. And now select the screen that has only the presentation. Okay. Is that good? That looks good. Good. That looks better. If, if, okay. yeah, I disconnected yeah, the perfect. other screen. You got, it. You got, you got it. it now. Got it. You got it. <laughs> should be good. Okay, awesome. Well, let's see. The other slides don't really matter. So there we go. Here we go. Uh, so, case one, let's start this over. Tonight's first case is about a lovely senior lady being seen by her local comprehensive ophthalmologist. She is a 79 year old female presenting with a red sore left eye. She complains of blurred vision for the past five days and Due to the presence of bilateral anterior chamber cell with keratic precipitates, she's diagnosed with anterior uveitis in both eyes. Uh, this is presumed to be chronic at the time. She also has ocular hypertension in the left eye. At this time, the dilated fundus exam was normal. And over the next month, she is treated with Pred Forte and various ocular hypotensive drops. She even receives a subtenon's injection of triamcinolone in the left eye, which seems to help. Her blurred vision gets a lot better. She gets off all her drops. Her AC inflammation and her KPs almost completely go away. But then two weeks after that, she comes back with blurred vision in the left eye. And this time the blurred vision is getting worse. A dilated fundus exam at this time shows some mild vitritis and some retinal infiltrates in the left eye. She is diagnosed with chorioretinitis in the left eye. And she started on Durazol four times a day and alpha again twice a day in the left eye. She is sent to see a retina specialist in a couple days. And the question I wanna ask um, the audience as well as the panelists right now is just, um, what more do you wanna know at this point? Does anyone have some thoughts about like what questions would you ask the patient? Are there things you wanna know in the history? Um, are there things you would look for in an exam? What, what kinds of things are you thinking about? Any systemic illnesses that they're aware of that they have? Any prior episodes, similar episodes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Matt, I was thinking along those lines, history prior episodes, predisposing systemic conditions, in particular autoimmune conditions, um, recent infections or exposures. And of course, we also um, would probably want a systemic review of systems, uh, though in this case, that was unremarkable. So it's been a couple days. Our 79 year old patient is now seeing a retina specialist. At this point, she's been reporting blurred vision off and on in her left eye for six weeks. And she is just starting to develop blurred vision in the right eye. Our initial diagnosis was bilateral anterior uveitis. So now we know she has active chorioretinitis in the left eye. And this, this is the panuveitis now. She's got AC cell, vitritis, chorioretinal involvement. Her ocular history is significant only for bilateral cataract surgery in the remote past and medical histories are consistent with her age. She quit smoking a long time ago. Not too much that's exciting there in the histories. In the right eye, her best corrective vision is 2040 at distance and 2025 at near. In the left eye, 2050 at distance and 2030 at near. And um, at this point, she actually has developed ocular hypertension in the right eye as well. She's still on treatment um, with IOP lowering drops in the left eye. A dilated fundus exam of both eyes shows that she has mild detritus, mild disc edema, and a single patchy infiltrate in the periphery of the right eye. In the left eye, she's got two plus vitritis, 360 disc edema, and multifocal infiltrates with overlying vitritis. So at this point, um, you know, she's diagnosed with chorioretinitis in the left greater than the right eye. Uh, the plan is to obtain some testing, including a PVD, some blood work, getting antibody testing, an MRI of the brain, uh, an AC tap is obtained. She started on Valtrex, one gram, three times a day. Um, also now, now she's on Alphagan twice a day in both eyes. Um, the Durazol is discontinued and she's referred to us at the academic center. And oh, by the way, it's a few days later, she's gone for all this testing. The PPD comes back positive. Um, so she sees her primary care doctor who sends her for chest x-ray. She sees the retina specialist again that afternoon who wants her to come see us right away. So at this point, 
Uh, our 79 year old female now arrives at UPMC as a direct admit and she's seen by some of my colleagues. The histories are largely unchanged, though it is noted that the patient's mother had a history of TB and she's on the Valtrex. On admission, her near vision is 2030 and 2040, though it, uh, it worsens pretty quickly to 2100 in both eyes. The uh, bedside intersegment exam is noted to be normal. And this is her dilated fundus exam. So what do you guys notice here? I'm gonna invite the audience to comment on any findings that they see in these pictures in the chat. And then I'll go, up, go ahead and just kind of describe some of the things that I'm seeing in these photos. So in both eyes, there's a hazy view due to vitritis. Uh, she's 360 blurring of the optic disc margins, which I think is real because she was noted previously to have disc edema in both eyes by her local retina specialist a few days ago. And there are also multifocal yellow white retinal lesions in um, both eyes actually, but you can see uh, you know, a little bit more uh, clearly the, the distinctions in the right eye. Um, the left eye, um, you know, there's a little more vitritis obscuring the view inferiorly there. And then there are also some perivascular hemorrhages in the, the right eye. Um, you can see those nasally here. So the patient's fundus exam findings are summarized here. In both eyes, she has two plus vitritis, optic disc edema, vasculitis, and multifocal yellow-white retinal lesions, um, which, by the way, have coalesced into large scalloped regions of retinal necrosis in the periphery of the left eye. So Opto's photos are a great option in this patient because there are all these peripheral findings. Uh, these images are showing the posterior pole in both eyes um, of this patient. And here's a, you know, a wider view of the right eye. You can see numerous multifocal yellow-white retinal lesions, most prominent nasally and then inferiorly. Uh, those are extending into the macula. There's significant macular involvement there. We also see extensive vasculitis with vascular sheathing and perivascular hemorrhages. And in the left eye, the view is a bit more hazy from vitritis overlying the lesions. Um, you can especially see that superior to the, the disc here. Um, there are yellow-white retinal lesions scattered diffusely, but there's also this large area of confluent retinal involvement with scalloped edge temporarily. And I really wanna highlight here the importance of a good peripheral exam, because uh, if you look at this image on the left, um, over here, temporally and inferiorly, you can just kind of see the edge of some of these lesions. But over on the right, you can see that there's extensive, you know, involvement of, of the retina in those areas. Um, just having the patient look a little bit farther, um, you know, in, in that direction. So, what was the time frame that this all happened? Yeah, so so I can go back and talk about that a little bit. So the patient was presented with blurred vision and pain in the left eye. Um, was diagnosed with bilateral anterior uveitis. Um, it was over about the next month that she was being treated with Predforte and um, Alphagan, and then uh, mostly, mostly Alphagan for, for ocular hypertension in that left eye, and then um, had the subtenons injection. It was about six weeks later when she finally saw the retina specialist, and within a week she had been uh, admitted you know, a few days, it was a few days after she saw the local retina specialist that she then was being admitted on, on our service. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this, this was actually pretty rapid progression, um, you know, from the time that she first complained of blurred vision in the right eye to, uh, you know, the time that, that she has all these, uh, let's go back to a picture of the right eye. The, the eye looks like this, you know, that that was like um, less than a week. Mm. Ricky, can I just uh, add yeah. something to your nice explanation? Um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that from what you presented, the uveitis was hyper hypertensive at the very beginning before mm. any eye drop was started. I think that's something to keep in mind because that what uveitis specialist wants to know uh, because it helped for the diagnosis. Yeah. And, and can you tell us if the vein and the arteries are involved or only the vein in this picture? Because right. it's in, very in important this, as well. You know, it's like an, when you are a UVT specialist, it's like an inquiry, police inquiry. So you need mm -hmm. all these small details to help you to yeah, find out I'm, the cause. 
Yeah, so I'm just going to point, uh, you know, in the right out here, just like infranasal to the disc here, you can see two vessels right next to each other, an artery and a vein, and they're both involved. So uh, this, this is, you know, arterial or and venular involvement with the vasculitis here. Okay, so let's, let's flip ahead here. I, I think... just want to maybe make a comment, and I think this is a more general here. comment that, you know, there, there are, well, not very, but there are a few entities that present as hypertensive uveitis. And I think it'd be a good time to maybe just review, and again, this picture obviously is, is fairly complicated, but just to review what that differential should be. Now, just in general, maybe we can get a few differentials from the group here. The only reason why I'm saying this is because I'm surrounded by retinal specialists and I feel very intimidated when I can't <laughs> speak about glaucoma. You should not. So say you should not. We'll take the opportunity to, um, to maybe have a differential and maybe I'll ask the panelists here, um, you know, what do they think when they just see a general thought, and I'm thank you, Dr. Herrera, for mentioning this as a lead off of hypertensive uveitis. Let's just talk about generalities in terms of how do we divide them, how do we classify them, and what are the differentials in that category? Anyone want to take a stab on this? We've brought in some of our fellows. We'll give them a bit of a break because they just started and they're in the middle of learning during COVID, which is challenging. But any of you guys want to get a start in terms of um, the differential diagnosis for, for hypertensive uveitis? How about viral first? Okay. Uh, I would, you know, usually jump to sort of HSV as my first sort of suspicion if it's viral. I won't take all of them. Yeah, it's I think I an extensive differential from, uh, let's see, Irfan Karani. Oh, look at, there. Look at this. So we've got a... Uh, I've got a differential later in the presentation, but you know, this is great. Um, oh my God, Irfan, what, what, Irfan, what is going on? This is not a plant. This is not a plant. Irfan, what, what are you doing here? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone can reference the, reference the chat group that Irfan managed to uh, type in, I'm sure. Um, very yeah. well done. <laughs> and we've we got can, an auto we text for that one. You mm -hmm. can kind of further divide them up in terms of unilateral and bilateral presentation and other ways as well. Um, so I think you, yeah, I mean, You've just spoiled the occasion, Irfan, but thank you for listing all those. I, I, I did only send them to a few people, so I think we can still <laughs> discuss it. Oh, okay, yes, I see that you did. Okay, well then, why don't you go ahead and, 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 and review that for everybody then? Yeah, so I mean, when I look at lists when it comes to, to kind of breaking down things from a UVI standpoint, I like to break it up, not necessarily into unilateral, bilateral, but really into kind of my different infectious causes and then my different inflammatory causes. And when it comes from the uh, infectious causes, I think we can break it down into uh, viral and viral and non-viral or viral and bacterial slash uh, we want to get into the protist side of things. So I think as, as, as Matt mentioned there, I mean, our virals can include HSV, VZV, CMV, uh, our other infectious causes, toxo. Um, when we get into the inflammatory side point, I, I mean, sarcoidosis really can always be on our lists. And why, and then, why sarcoidosis? Uh, why sarcoidosis? I mean, mm -hmm. I think just mainly just by nature of its, uh, I mean, its ability to really present in any way. So, I mean, in this situation, we're looking more at a posterior uveitis. If yeah. we were thinking something more along intermediate, not necessarily with posterior retinal findings, I'd be more inclined to discuss scarcoidosis, but... Uh, Usually what I do is I, I put a gonio lens on the, on the eye if the, if the pressure is high. And I look, if I think it can be sarcoidosis, I look for nodules in the trabecular meshwork. Ah, uh, okay. Sarcoidosis, and that's the same for VKH. Because it's oh, okay, good. Yeah. And then we have all of our fun kind of some, interior segment. Do those nodules have something to do with the mechanism of the pressure increase? Yes. Is it causing yes, the angle because it creates a blockage in the, that's what I've learned, but Congested. it creates a blockage in the trabecular mesh work. But I'm not a glaucoma specialist, but during my, my, my fellowship in uveitis, we always put a, a gonio lens to look at if we could find them or not. So that's something I always remember. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say sarcoid would not be the highest on my list for hypertensive uveitis. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, it's nice to list all of them, to be honest, but I don't think it would be high up on my list. I don't know what others think. I think the- What would, what would you put up on, what would you put up higher on your list? So things like Poster Schlossman? I like uh, the, I like the phacolytic and the, and the, um, and the, and the lens induced causes. I think that's a, okay. always a good differential. I like, uh, you know, UGG syndrome. I think that's good. That's good in there as well. Um, and I think, of course, we have to think about infectious, the virals and the toxins, as you mentioned already. 
Uh, Fuchs heterochromic intercyclitis, posner Schlossman, I think you have in there, which is good to mention as well. But, you know, I mean, sure, any of you guys can present as hypertension, but I, I, in my experience, it's not usually sarcoid, though. It can. And, of course, there's other secondary causes of angle closure from, from posterior, um, uh, you know, synechia that can develop, that can cause secondary Definitely. elevated pressure from angle closure. Don't forget that. From any uveitic uh, ideology that cause pupil block, synechia. So Especially that's also if part of the angle closure. Um, and there is always on the list, there's always syphilis because syphilis can mimic anything. So we always ask for syphilis. Like you might want to, I mean, something that we've talked a bit about that's kind of interesting is what the mechanism of the hypertensive uveitis, because we often talk about the trabeculitis really as a characteristic feature of the herpetic um, viruses. But I, I, I'm, I, to be honest, I mean, apart from the uh, lens-based ones, where we have a general understanding of what causes the hypertension. Uh, I'm interested to hear people's thoughts on kind of the pathology that drives the other sources of hypertension apart from a true trabeculitis. All right. Well, we, we, I love the glaucoma discussion. I don't want to. I don't want to hog the time here. Uh, I'll just. I'll just give you my quick answer. I think the trabeculitis one is a little complicated, and you're going to hear people have different opinions on whether this condition exists. I think there's probably pros and cons, or, or different, you know, evidence and, and, and questions on that. But that certainly would be one of the things we talk about. You know, trabecular precipitates and nodules. Something to look at if you look closely in some of these patients, you do see. Uh, precipitates uh, in the TM or on the TM or nodules, as we heard from Dr. Rara as well. Obviously, these patients have elevated aqueous protein and a plasmoid protein that can be related as well, enzymatic causes. And of course, long-term, these patients get trabecular sclerosis over time. And that's why we sometimes see these patients who chronically develop elevated pressure that is not controlled on medical therapy eventually. So those are some of them. Remember though, most uveitides classically present reduced, reduced IOP. And that's because of cellular body inflammation, cyclitis, hyposecretion, increasing the start outflow. That's how commonly we see some of these more typical anterior uh, uveitis that present. But hypertension, I think, as we heard already, first thing to think about is infectious viral causes. It's very important to, to put that in your differential. Now, this is obviously a very dramatic picture, but even in just in a, in a simple, well, relatively simple anterior uveitis, we have to have that in our differential. When we speak about how do we, how do we actually uh, you know, uh, diagnose these, these entities as well. So, um, yeah, good discussion. I, I don't want to take up too much time. I'll let Ricky get back to it, but always in your back pocket, have that, uh, differential diagnosis that, that, uh, has been nicely discussed here. Yeah. So I'm, let's see, I'll bring, uh, bring some of these slides back. I don't know how to go back and forth easily, but I think we were right about here. Okay. There we go. All right, so I did want to bring in, a, you know, we'll, we'll go to another teaching point. I wanted to bring in the um, NIH grading system for vitreous haze. So this is published by Nusenblatt et al. In, uh, the, the, this was developed in the early 1980s actually, but I think this is a system that's still mostly used clinically. Um, I, I will mention as a side point, there actually is a newer grading system published by uh, Dr. Janet Davis et al. in uh, 2010. Uh, but that increases the number of grading classes from four to eight, and it's just too complicated for me as an entry segment person. So we're going to go back and just, you know, I, I, I think it's used mostly by retina and uveitis researchers who want to be a little more uh, specific. Um, so we'll, we'll go, go learn the one that's clinically useful here. So um, it, it's relatively simple. So one plus vitritis here. Um, the RNFL details are a little bit hazy. Two plus vitritis, uh, the disc and the vessels start to be blurred. And then three plus vitritis, you can no longer see the vessels, the disc is still visible. And then in four plus vitritis, the optic nerve disappears and all you see is an eye full of vitritis. So I wanted to, after going through this, revisit these initial fundus photos and ask what people think, like how would you grade the vitritis in these photos? And just as a reminder, you know, three plus is where the vessels disappear and four plus is where the nerve disappears. I just wanted to give people a chance to kind of chime in the chat. Um, what people are saying. Yeah, I want to see what people are saying. What do people we got think? a two. One for two. Let's see. Yeah. Are we allowed yeah. two to three? Yeah, and I, I would agree that? with that. I, th I think I would say like two plus in the, the right eye. In the left eye, you know, inferiorly, there's some, some vessels that are starting to be obscured. So two to maybe, maybe two to three plus in the left eye. You know, there's a little more vitritis there, but I, I think that's pretty good. 
So, um, all right. So at this point, your patient's undergone a TB skin test, a litany of blood work, and a couple imaging studies. And here are the results. She has a positive PPD, a borderline ANA, um, positive Toxo IgG, uh, positive HSD IgG, and um, everything else is unremarkable. Lyme and syphilis are negative. MRI brain on the initial read at the outside hospital said um, something about maybe lymphoma, but our university-based neuroradiologists didn't think so when they took a look at the scan. And also for some reason, the VCV serologies were not performed. So, you know, this is uh, this is where I placed the differential diagnosis slide. I know we already got started on talking about causes of um, hypertensive anterior uveitis. Um, this differential, I think there's going to be a, a lot of overlap with what people were chiming in earlier in the chat, but uh, I'm dividing these into infectious and non-infectious etiologies. And um, while I'm providing a differential for necrotizing retinitis, I just want to remind everyone this, this in this patient is truly a panuveitis. She started out with AC inflammation. Vitreous is the primary site of involvement for intermediate uveitis. And of course, now we have coriretinal involvement as well. Um, so in this particular case, we were re really leaning towards something infectious. We're not thinking so much endogenous bacterial or fungal endophthalmitis, given that the patient was you know, walking around, she's systemically very uh, relatively healthy. Um, but she happened to develop all these crazy eye findings. So we do consider masquerades like toxo, syphilis, um, TB to be um, you know, relatively high on the differential. They should always be on the di differential in this age group. And Lyme is actually a, a pretty common masquerade in Western Pennsylvania. It's endemic uh, in, in Pittsburgh. So aspergillus is more likely to cause necrotizing retinitis compared with candida and other fungal causes. And that brings us to the herpes viruses, which can cause a variety of presentations of necrotizing retinitis, include, including acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, and CMV retinitis. And um, ARN is typically more observed in immunocompetent individuals, whereas porn and CMV retinitis are seen more in the immunocompromised. And we did also consider lymphoma and sarcoidosis, though the negative MRI brain and chest x-ray were reassuring. So at this point, I actually had a... We have a poll. Poll question. I don't know if... Let's, let's do this. Hold on. Here it comes. Yeah. Launch poll. Did it work? There you go. Yeah, I see it. All awesome. right. I don't think I'm allowed to vote. Have at it. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Panelists, I don't think are allowed to vote. No, that's cool. They're coming in. We'll give it some time. Yeah, let's let's give that a little bit of time. In the meantime, this patient was started on Durazol initially early on, and uh, even got a, a sub tenons injection. Yeah, it was uh, it was pred forte initially for the first uh, for the first few weeks, and then sub tenons kind of in, in the one eye. In the, that was all. Yeah, that, that yeah. it was it was pred forte in both eyes. The anterior uveitis was bilateral, ocular, hyper, ocular hypertension in the left eye. So I think she was on alpha again and maybe some other ocular hypertensive drops in the left eye. And then, yeah, and then uh, uh, subtenons catalog in the left eye. And then uh, when she came back with recurrent inflammation was started on Durazol. Mm. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm seeing some results come in. So we actually have kind of a relatively even Split. Nobody thinks it's toxo, but we have uh, quite a number of votes for, I, th I think HSV is winning at almost half the votes. And then we have VCV and TB split for second place. So this will actually be great. I think there'll be some, some good teaching points that will come up here. Um, and, and all of those, you know, were things that we definitely were considering and, and working to, uh, to uh, test for and, and, and rule out. So, all right. So here we go. These are our results. Um, the local retina specialist did an AC tap prior to sending the patient to us. And actually, um, a TB is apparently a send out test that you can do for, for a, an aqueous sample. So that took a while to come back. But uh, when the patient got to us, we, we did a, a, another aqueous paracentesis combined with a vitreous tap and inject because we had pretty high suspicion for a viral cause. And all of these samples came back positive for VZP.
All right. Uh, I wanted to go back to this for just a minute, actually. I had I had written down something too. Um, so we we gave intravitreal plus carnet um, in, in the setting of doing a vitreous tap and inject. And I did want to ask our panelists, I know these patients are at high risk for retinal breaks in the areas of peripheral necrosis. So I just wanted to ask um, the retina specialist with us tonight, what's your opinion about the usefulness of a vitreous tap in this setting? Um, you know, is, is an aqueous tap sufficient? Are these patients at higher risk of getting a retinal detachment if you if you do a vitreous tap? Um, and I, I mean, we're doing an intravitreal injection anyway, so it's probably similar in risk, but I just wanted to, to ask um, if you guys wanted to comment um, about, about the utility of a vitreous tap, is it even needed? I, I don't think it's necessary to do a vitreous tap. Uh, it's uncomfortable to the patient and um, it's just not necessary for, for viral etiologies. Yeah, how good is I the- fault you, I wouldn't fault you for doing it, but I don't think it's necessary. Right, the, the yield with a, a, an aqueous paracentesis, I mean, our, our aqueous sample, uh, do you feel like the, the sensitivity and specificity is high enough that, that you get by without vitreous in this case? Yes. Yeah, for PCR, absolutely. Especially, and especially if the patient is immunocompromised from the study, even if immunocompetent, the sensitivity is very good and specificity, but if the patient is immunocompromised, I think the sensitivity is even 100% of the ACTAP PCR. <laughs> so it's very high. Okay. All right. So yeah, that, that I think was, uh, was a good discussion. I'm going to go on to the next slide. And this slide is here basically because I just wanted to include flaming eyeball somewhere. Uh, so we get this slide. And I saw a lot of comments in the chat earlier about, uh, about Barnes. So you guys were all correct. Um, our dear elderly patient with anterior uveitis actually ends up having something rather scary, pan-uveitis bilaterally due to acute retinal necrosis. And in this case, um, that the cause is varicella zoster virus. So we treated this patient um, immediately upon admission, we, we transitioned the patient from oral Valtrex to IV acyclovir, 10 milligrams per kilogram, three times a day. Um, we got an infectious disease consult. They agreed with this decision. We also um, started the patient with intravitreal phoscarnate injections in both eyes. And those were done every two to three days uh, times six. So the patient was in the hospital for two or three weeks. And at some point, we send the patient home on oral acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day for six weeks. And actually, from the reading I did, patients are sometimes kept on oral antivirals after um, an admission for ARN for up to 14 weeks. And I think the idea there is if the patient does not already have bilateral involvement, um, there's the concern that the, the viral infection will activate in the other eye. And so um, the idea is to keep the patient on antiviral coverage for two or three months to try to prevent that from happening. Um, I did want to ask if uh, any of our panels had comments on the particular treatment course we chose in this case, like, like why, um, you know, why we made the, the decision. Enrique, as you're, as you're asking and as our retina colleagues will, will comment, I mean, we, we recently had a case that was in our practice and we had a lot of discussion that came up. One of the questions that came up would be, for example, the use of and timing of steroids, whether that should be something that should be considered. Mm -hmm. um, the other question was, we had some controversy about the role of prophylactic laser, which yes. I think you mentioned. So I wonder whether that can be incorporated in the discussion as well, including the, the treatment you provided here. Yeah, we do have that on it. We have both of those things uh, on our slides a little bit later. Okay, we sorry. Back the slide. So I might ask that we come back to those just so we can talk about them in context. But definitely, we'll save the, the. We'll definitely visit those those controversies. I think that's really important. So I'll, I'll jump in and say that it's been shown that oral treatment with Valtrex or acyclovir is equivalent to IV as far as um, getting into the eye. But here you have a bilateral case. It looks really severe. It just makes me feel better to do IV, even though it may not be necessary. Uh, you, you certainly can improve compliance. Taking, you know, acyclovir five times a day can be a little bit complex if the lady's living alone or making sure she's taking her medication. So I have no problem doing IV, even though the, the um, 
penetration into the eye may be similar with oral. I like doing the phoscarnate injections because I think it just complements what we're, what we're trying to do here in saving this eye, these eyes. As far as treatment, uh, for how long to maintain treatment, acyclovir, as long as you have decent renal functions, really, there's really no risk. Certainly, if it's a one-eyed patient, I do absolutely for three months or longer to prevent the fellow eye from becoming involved. Anyone else want to jump in? I think that's pretty good. All right, so a few months later, the patient comes back and her final visual acuity outcomes are 2050 and 2060. Uh, the retinal lesions at this point uh, you know, have progressed and there is pigmentation around the margins of those uh, necrotic areas of the retina. Um, so this is actually a, for ARN, this is actually a pretty, for bilateral ARN, it's actually a pretty good outcome in terms of, of visual acuity um, and, and not progressing to retinal detachment, et cetera. Um, I did have a list of teaching points here and then I have some background slides where we can touch on those, those controversies that, that, uh, that Dr. Ahmed mentioned just a, a minute ago. So uh, a few teaching points from this case. Uh, first, AC tap is essential, vitreous tap, can increase the retinal detachment risk um, in these patients with necrotic peripheral retina. And so uh, personally, as an anti-segment person, I would probably do the aqueous paracentesis and then defer um, a vitreous tap to uh, the decision on that to the retina specialist I'm sending the patient to for intravitreals and decision about IV, et cetera. Um, serologic testing and MRI have limited value and certainly uh, I would be hesitant to delay the initiation of treatment uh, in order to obtain test, further testing. Um, that said, toxo TB and syphilis are significant uh, masquerades in this age group, so they should all be ruled out. Um, toxo, you can do an aqueous PCR. Um, TB, you know, probably quantiferin if this patient's getting admitted, though a PPD is also acceptable. And an FTA ABS is a, a good start for syphilis. Though, if it does come back positive, then you're going to need an RPR or a VDRL in order to, um, you know, confirm active infection. Does that, does that all sound pretty, pretty good, Dr. Rara? Yes, that's right. We, I think all the retina and uveitis specialists have seen cases of syphilis like that, uh, with no improvement with Foscarnet uh, uh, um, and acyclovir, and then the syphilis comes back positive. It's syphilis, you understand why? Uh, and uh, sometimes toxoplasmosis in an immunocompromised patient, especially, can really mimic um, TB is rare, but it uh, gives retinitis. Most of the time it's chorio retinitis. Yeah. Yeah, TB is rare. I think the suspicion was higher in this case because we knew that the patient had uh, a potential exposure in the past with her, her mother as well as the, the positive PPD. Prior to but it. it's it's rare that TB mimic uh, um, most of the time is more with vasculitis and choroiditis spots, but it's it's rare. But rare it to look happen. like that. Can yeah. happen. That makes sense. Okay. Especially immunocompromised patient. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, uh, there there's a meta-analysis that was published a few years ago in ophthalmology where they looked at um, treatment. Um, and diagnostic testing for ARN. And they actually said that aqueous and vitreous PCRs were positive in 79 to 100% of cases where ARN was suspected. So, um, you know, the sensitivity and specificity of, of, an, of an aqueous paracentesis is, is actually quite good here. Um, they did include vitreous samples as well in that, but that was all within this range. So that's, you know, 80 to 100% um, positive test if the diagnosis is suspected. I think that's pretty, you know, it's pretty good. Um, I think Dr. Eller, when we were discussing this case, you had a, a good point about, you know, if you do an aqueous PCR and it initially comes back negative, but your suspicion for ARN is high, um, you said, I think that you would go ahead and, and do another, uh, collect another sample and run another test. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and that leads us to our second, to my, my next point here, which is that uh, there's really the risks of treating with these antiviral medications generally are the side effects and risk profile are pretty low and the risks of not treating 
um, you know, viral retinitis are pretty high because these cases progress so rapidly and without treatment, you know, the second eye can become involved. Um, even after initiating treatment, these patients can go on to have retinal detachment. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's really important to, to have a low threshold to intervene. Um, I did want to mention a few situations where, um, and this I'm going to maybe post to my, my, my panelists, um, a few situations where you might have to think twice about starting Valtrex. Um, and Dr. Rar, did you have any comments on, on these? I don't have any comment. It's uh, it, it Valtrex can cause renal insufficiency. Um, uh, IV phoscarnet as well. Uh, so that's uh, that's an issue, definitely. Yeah, I think there's renal dosing. So if, if a patient has renal insufficiency, um, if you're concerned about that, you can you can uh, you know monitor their renal function and make sure that you're dosing appropriately. So you might you might have to you know if you're treating. Uh, if you're managing some of these medications as an outpatient, you might have to coordinate with the, the patient's um, primary care doctor or an ID specialist. So, um, and, and the other thing is prompt referral uh, for consideration of intravitreals and IV antibiotics. Um, all right, so background slides. So let's see. Okay, so uh, ARN typically develops in immunocompetent adults who present with blurred vision, floaters, pain, and photophobia. And, and it's interesting because floaters and pain, that's actually in contrast to um, say CMV retinitis and porn where um, you know, those patients typically don't have much vitritis. And so they don't have, they, they tend to not complain about floaters um, and, and they don't tend to complain about pain as much. And that's probably because there's not as uh, you know, much of an immune response in these immunocompromised patients. Um, ARN actually can occur in immunocompromised patients. Uh, testing for you know, HIV is actually um, probably a good idea in these, these patients who are, um, you know, who come in with ARN, but it, it typically is immunocompetent patients. And then the etiology actually is about two thirds VZV. Um, it can also be HSV one or two. Typically younger adults will have HSV two, whereas um, the, the elderly are more likely to have VZV or HSV one. And CMV and EB, EBV have shown up in case reports, um, though I'm, I'm not totally convinced that these like CMV cases, that it's not just uh, somewhere on like the CMV retinitis spectrum. Um, I think there's a bit of controversy about that. Uh, I wanted to provide the diagnostic criteria for ARN um, provided by the American Uveitis Society. So there are five required criteria. And I put a picture from our patient just so that we can you know, notice and appreciate some of those features, but um, peripheral retinal necrosis with discrete borders, one or more areas, circumferential spread. So it tends to spread around the periphery first um, with late involvement of the posterior pole, rapid progression and absence of therapy, occlusive vasculopathy, which has a preference for um, arterioles actually, which is you know, something unique that Dr. Herrera pointed out earlier, and then prominent inflammation in both the anterior chamber and the vitreous. So our patient had all of those things as well as some of these supporting findings, such as uh, optic neuropathy and, and pain. The, uh, let's see, I see someone raising their hand. What does that mean? Sometimes it's a question, I can check it out. Okay. All right, so Sohani is, uh, she's actually, a, she was one of my co-residents back in Pittsburgh and is now a first year retina fellow in Pittsburgh. So uh, we can. I'd say type the chat, um, type the question into the chat. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so exam findings, I divided these based on time course. So, um, you know, er the early findings actually can be pretty subtle. These patients often present first with uveitis, uh, things like what our patient had, uh, AC cell, keratic precipitates, mild vitritis, and then as things progress, they develop retinal necrosis associated with severe vitritis and vasculitis. And then the, later on, these patients, um, many of them actually majority will, will go on, more than half will go on to develop phragmatogenous retinal detachments due to necrotic breaks. These typically occur um, like right at the interface of the necrotic retina with the uh, unaffected retina. And there can be multiple breaks and sometimes there's a tractional component these, these retinal attachments tend to be pretty messy and tough to fix. 
And sometimes these patients have other findings too. And again, some of these things we saw in our patient, like ocular hypertension, um, disc edema, occlusive vasculitis with retinal hemorrhages, and then actually frosted branch angiitis can occur, though that's more associated with, uh, with ARN caused by HSV1 rather than BZV. And of course, we know that that happens with CMV retinitis as well. Management, we talked about some of this. Aqueous paracentesis is important with PCRs for herpes viruses, as well as toxo, quantiferin, and FTA, ABS to rule out mimickers. And, uh, and then treatment. So this is where we get to, uh, you know, kind of controversy role of steroids, um, but systemic antivirals. So we often do treat with IV. And um, I, I think it's thought that IV maybe works a little better than, than PO, um, as well as that valacyclovir and famcyclovir maybe uh, orally are maybe a little better than, than acyclovir. Uh, to be honest, though, there's not really good evidence for any of this stuff with ARN because there aren't randomized controlled trials. This is relatively rare. And, and most of the data is expert opinion and retrospective studies. So um, yeah. Can I just add something, Ricky? Yeah, if you're Thanks. very anxious uh, about a bilateral case, uh, like Dr. Eller uh, managed very well with uh, IV, uh, acyclovir, because it's bilateral, if you cannot keep the patient in the hospital or if there is any issue, there are recent uh, publications from Prof. Lightman. She's a UVIT specialist, very well known in the UK and everywhere in the world. And she's done a very good uh, work uh, publishing about the two gram TID. That's what you've written there. A valacyclovir two gram TID. So that's an option. If really you cannot uh, have the IV acyclovir, acyclovir. Uh, something to keep in mind. Yes. Yeah. So I, um, this patient was initially started on one gram TID and then admitted on the uh, IV acyclovir though. Um, two grams TID, probably for, for ARN. You know, we typically are using one gram TID for um, anterior uveitis, um, but but I think two grams TID probably is better for, for um, suspected viral. I'll disease. make one other comment that in America, United States of America, as opposed to Canada or France, we have a problem with healthcare costs and Velcyclovir, uh, Veltrex can be very expensive. And if we see a patient in clinic and say, we can treat you as an outpatient, here's the prescription, stop at your druggist and, and get this filled, they may find out that they, it could be several hundred dollars or more for the prescription, and it may take them a couple of days before they start the treatment. And so that's why I think it's another reason why if you admit them, you can get them started on IV legitimately, and then we can worry about getting the uh, prescription filled as, they, as they're discharged. So I think it's another point we have to think about in, in America that you may not in other countries. How is that Ike in, in Canada? Is it covered as an outpatient? You know, I have to I have to think about that one. I don't know for sure if it is. I think, I think it is. Maybe one of my Canadian colleagues can answer that one. I don't prescribe it very much. Um, yeah, I don't think it is. So we often will tend to stay away from prescribing Valtrex just because it is so expensive. There you go. I think I think I think Bambir, 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 Bambir is also not covered as well. I think Bambir is. Yeah, and that intravitreal foscarnate or gancyclovir can be used. That's actually considered um, adjunctive. So you know, in, in severe cases or bilateral cases like this, again, we're more likely to use those. And then oral prednisone. It's typically sixty to eighty milligrams daily. Though I think the the acceptable range is like 0.5 to two milligrams per kilogram uh, daily. This is a bit controversial, I think, as, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, and the, the guidelines that I've read vary. Um, you know, people either do prednisone starting um, 24 hours after treatment, sometimes you know 48 hours after treatment, or some people will wait until the patient, the patient's uh, chorioretinal lesions are starting to regress and and uh, improve, and then they'll start the, the steroid treatment. And I think also I read that that people are more likely to use steroids in cases that are more severe or where there's more botrytis. Um, maybe our panel can comment on that and just where where do you guys think the role of systemic steroids is in terms of treating ARN? I don't know if Dr. Eller wants to comment about it, but 
The problem is that no one really knows when to start steroid. It's a risk to reactivate as a virus. That's a big risk. The good thing is if you use oral steroid, you can stop it straight away. If you inject it inside of the eye, if you inject a trace for instance, you cannot remove it. Or you can, but not as easily as oral. So most of the uveitis specialists, when they really want to use it, they use oral and they wait for a few days after having started this, uh, the antiviral treatment to make sure the virus is not that active. But I don't know what, uh, what um, Dr. Eller experience is with oral steroids or injections. Ne I would never ever consider injecting triamcinolone in the eye in an infectious case. Uh, no matter what the infection is, you're, you're going to blow it up, whether it's toxo, fungal, bacterial. The, uh, you know, this is a particularly, uh, um, there's a particular amount of inflammation in this case. I would certainly consider it. And you have to look at the patient and say, are they diabetic? Because if they are and you start 60 of prednisone, they go from an oral agent to, to insulin. It's a big problem. So you, you look at their underlying health as well, and that's going to guide you. My experience with, with uh, HSV ARN, whether it's one or two, is they tend to start out with fairly quiet looking eyes on presentation. Within a week, you can barely see the disc. They really fill up with inflammatory debris very quickly. And those patients, I will start prednisone you know, within two, three days after I've started the antiviral therapy. The VZV, it's you know, depending on what they look like. Okay. So um, yeah, so surgical treatment. I'm going to try to go quickly here because I know that we. Uh, I want to make sure that Jamie has plenty of time for her case as well. But surgical treatment is notoriously difficult here. Um, typically, people will use silicone oil. I think some people will, uh, you know, every now and then people will use like C38, like a long, uh, longer acting, um, you know, expansile gas. But laser retinopexy for prophylaxis. I think this is pretty controversial. Um, I don't know that that's, uh, my impression is that that's not, not used widely, but that there are some who think that it's helpful in preventing, um, preventing retinal detachment. And the thing is that, it has okay. really not been really proven actually. So uh, now people tend not to do it. I don't know what Dr. Eller thinks, but there's not really studies that prove that it's efficient. There are two reasons I don't do it. Number one is I think it's hard to do. These eyes are, are, are inflamed, they're tender, and, and you have to really treat with a fairly strong barricade to, to um, prevent progression, and it probably doesn't work anyway. That's number one. Number two is if they do detach, I like to have some virgin healthy retina surrounding the area of necrosis to actually put fresh laser in. So if, they, if I do the laser, it progresses through the laser, then I have, I have to put my laser in even further posteriorly to the lesions. So I, I would rather not do that. Okay. And then um, I did kind of map out the course here. So unilateral at symptom onset, circumferential spread, then, then goes to the poster pole, progresses rapidly, it can become bilateral in about one third. Um, even after treatment's initiated, patients tend to ha continue having progression for the next like 48 hours. Um, but they do eventually stabilize. Usually uh, after three or four days, they'll stabilize and start regressing. And, and ultimately after several weeks, uh, you'll see pigmentation at the edges of lesions. So this is uh, some images from a, a study where they did optos photos showing the regressed areas with the pigmentation at the edge. Um, prognosis is very variable. It, like I mentioned before, 50 to 75% of these patients will develop a retinal detachment and half of them have pretty poor final visual acuity, 2200 or worse. And if there's a retinal detachment or ischemic optic neuropathy, those tend to be the patients who end up with worse, worse visual acuity outcomes. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, you know, this, this is actually a really important thing. Despite being a rare diagnosis, acute retinal necrosis is the most common clinical entity associated with litigation and uveitis. And the things that help are actually um, the same kinds of things that we, we tell, tell our, uh, you know, tell providers about, about, um, actually about, you know, premium IOL patients, you know, that positive relationship, um, educating patients in advance, you know, when the diagnosis is made, letting them know uh, what types of complications, you know, might happen down the road, 
uh, those kinds of things can go a long way in, uh, in maintaining a good relationship and preventing litigation in these cases if, if patients know what to expect. So um, I just want to- The Halloween part of this presentation, the scary yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, so a few lessons I learned, um, dilate both eyes in every patient with anterior uveitis at every visit. Um, as, as long as it's active, you know, if it's, if it's getting better, if there's an, an obvious known cause, you know, that may be maybe less uh, concern, but maintain a, a low threshold for suspecting misdiagnosis, especially in cases where there are concerning features. An elderly patient with no predisposing systemic conditions or, um, you know, but no prior episodes, bilateral presentation, ocular hypertension, which, which should uh, immediately raise concern for these viral causes and some of the other causes that we uh, talked about earlier, um, such as TACTO, um, start treatment early. Uh, you know, you really can prevent morbidity in these patients um, with early treatment. You can prevent the, the virus from spreading to the other eye. And, um, you know, it, even after treatment starts, they can keep progressing and they can develop retinal detachments, but, but the earlier the treatment, the more likely you are to, to keep these patients seeing well and have a good outcome. So um, just in the interest of time, I, I have an acknowledgement slide. I think Jamie does too at the end of hers, but I'm, I'm gonna let Jamie uh, go ahead and, and start her case. Um, while, while we're getting things set up, you know, if anyone has final questions or comments, I think that's probably fine. I'm gonna let Jamie get set up. I just have, a, there's a couple yeah. questions. You know, we kind of ignored YouTube a little bit. There's also a YouTube yeah. feed as well. And actually, yeah. just if we can get the panelists to say quick answers here. Um, uh, are these patients, uh, at higher risk for retinal detachment for their whole life? Yes or no? I think once the lesions have healed, they've had a PVD, probably not that much higher. Um, why is Valtrus contraindicated in immunocompromised patients? Is it and why, why so? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's contraindicated. I think that those were just the cases where, um, you know, maybe maybe those are Cases where maybe you should, uh, maybe uh, it would be good to talk to their medical doctor or, um, you know, it's, it was more like these are cases where you would uh, maybe have a second thought, whereas a patient who is completely healthy, uh, really it's pretty low risk to start Valtrex. So uh, Dr. Herrera, do you have a comment on that? The question is, is Valtrex contraindicated in, I don't, I, sorry, I missed the question. Yeah, yeah the, question is, the question is, is Valtrex contraindicated in immunocompromised patients? And if so, why? No, no it's not. Yeah. Okay. Not that you that had that. a slide about HIV. Someone had mentioned TTPHUS. I mean, that's going way back. So I don't know. No. Nah. Okay. Um, and just a question about quickly, would, would treatment been different if this was an immunocompromised pediatric patient? Any, di any difference if it was a pediatric patient immunocompromised in the treatment? No, there wouldn't be any difference. I would do the same thing. Great. That was uh, that was a quite a case. Uh, I've already got some messages from people about just how how fascinating that case was and all the learning pearls you've given. So thank you so much, Ricky and the panelists. We want to continue along here. Get Jamie on board. So Jamie, we'll hand it off to you. All right. So thanks so much for having us again. Great case, Ricky. So here's another case of can't miss this retina. Um, this patient was cared for, cared for by my colleagues Kenny Tomansong and Dr. Prensky, who's on here as a panelist. So it starts off with a 28-year-old young healthy male who is a hiker and a steel worker who presented with gradual worsening blurry vision for three months duration, and that was associated with headaches. He was sent from an outside optometrist to the ER to see me as a first-year resident. His vision was 2300 in that eye. He pinholed to 2060, and the left eye vision was 2030. His pupils were previously dilated by the optometrist, but you could still appreciate a marked RAPD in the right eye. His pressures, eye movements, computational visual fields, and colors were normal in both eyes. His anterior segment was normal in both eyes, no, ce no cell in either eye. Or his fundus was rem remarkable in the right eye for the following. These are DRS photos taken in the ER. You can see marked optic nerve, uh, disc blurring 360 degrees, obscuration of the vessels, some flame hemorrhages, 
You can also see some hard exudates around the nasal margin of the optic nerve head. And there was some macular edema spillover from the optic nerve head into the macula. There's also this large four by two and a half disc diameter superior nasal intraretinal lesion that was pretty well defined. And it was pigmented, meaning that it looked kind of chronic. And the left eye was pretty normal, maybe some nasal elevation of the optic nerve head. Here are some photos taken later on um, in the office, but just to give you a, a view, the periphery was largely normal. So at this point, um, I'll ask, you know, I know we're low on time, but what questions would you like to ask the patient? Let's go to our, let's go to our, our fellow panelists here, our fellows here. Anything? I think I would just, I think I would just jump in and first just ask about their medical history, if there's anything, and any travel, like, so, I mean, general medical history, any sort of systemic conditions, previous concerns that they had in their past history, and then coming up to more recently, any traveling, uh, any sort of exposures, Trauma. that kind of thing. Yeah. Trauma. So more history, I agree. So he hasn't really traveled internationally throughout his lifetime, mainly Northeastern US. In fact, he hikes 10 miles a day in Western PA with his dogs every day. No recent tick bites for him, but his dogs are always covered in ticks, he says. And just to you know, remind you, Western PA, uh, Lyme is endemic to this region. So it's actually not that abnormal to see neural Lyme. His review of systems was other, otherwise negative besides the blurry vision and headaches. His family history, he said that pretty much everyone in his family had high blood pressure. Doesn't remember any kidney disease or cancers or tumors. No one who died young. He's a steel worker without much surgical or ocular history. In terms of the headaches, they're left-sided. They are positional, so they're worse when he bends over unrelieved with over-the-counter medication. And they're better now compared to two months ago. Now, with careful peripheral exam with my senior resident, I'm gonna put a circle around it, but we found this intraretinal tuft um, that if you look really closely, it has an artery and a vein that were kind of, tor kind of torturous and coming off the disc toward it. So now I'm gonna show you a classic picture of this. Um, again, that artery, that vein with tortuosity, feeder vessel going into this um, retinal capillary angioma. So knowing that finding, I'll uh, ask the audience, what test would you like to order next? Or you can testing you type it in. An option. What's that? Is genetic testing an option? Genetic testing is an option. It might take a while though. We're not that fast in Pittsburgh. I'm yet? interested in some angiography, so MRI. MRIs, MRI abdo, MRI head. Uh, specifically, I mean angio angiography. Yeah, so we got an MRI of the head with and without contrast. These are contrasted studies. So you can see here almost a two centimeter mass in his right cerebellum. And this was actually surrounded by edema and associated with mass effect in a facement of his fourth ventricle. Um, you can see by this top arrow here and the bottom arrow shows some, some low lying cerebellar tonsils. So in addition to what's going on in his eye, we also think about high um, intracranial pressure. The radiologists here are really good. They run it as atypical meningioma, mangioparasitoma, or mangioblastoma. We also did an infectious inflammatory workup, which is largely unremarkable. So now we have a polling question, if we can pull that up. Um, but what's your diagnosis?
All right, the polling questions coming in. We'll, we see some uh, comments coming in the chat group as well. We've got a pretty sharp audience. They've kind of kept up with you with some of the testing and some of the differentials earlier on, which is it's good to see. Um, you're you're taking here. Names. You're, you've been studying for OCAPs. <laughs> <laughs> good memories. <laughs> Yeah, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, the audience uh, it looks like they've nailed this one. Yeah, let's just share the poll here for people to. Oh, right. 83%. You're on board. It is VHL syndrome. Oh. So then we brought him the next day um, to the eye clinic to confirm our suspected diagnosis. Here's an autofluorescence just to give you an overview of the eyes again. If we do a line scan OCT through the optic nerve, of the right eye, you might appreciate that there's some sort of masses within the optic nerve head. And then you see some uh, nasal edema here. And then if we do a line scan through that superior nasal lesion, uh, vertical and horizontal, you can see perhaps some intraretinal involvement, dilated areas that could suggest an angiomatous appearance. And FA is really important actually in VHL um, because it can help you see those areas that light up and are angiomatous in nature. Um, so you can see three peripapillary retinal angiomas near the disc. And you can also see it here just a little bit later on. These do not leak, um, they stain later on. And then we were able to get a wide field view and catch that little area, retinal angioma way off in the periphery that kind of clued us in. And it looks like um, it is, a, you know, having a feeder vessel. The left eye was normal. And so importantly, at this point, we were able to make the recommendations with Dr. Prensky to the um, main team, the neurosurgery team and that is to rule out pheochromocytoma um, with plasma, urine metanephrines, urine catecholamines, and an abdominal ultrasound. Now, why is this important? Because if a pheo is not identified, um, he could be brought back for neurosurgery and have an unexpected catecholamine surge during surgery. In fact, I read that 25 to 50% of hospital deaths of patients with unmanaged or unknown pheochromosantomas, which could have been this case, um, actually occur during induction of anesthesia when they're unable to prepare for a case and just think it's a, you know, a routine case of taking out a tumor. So he underwent tumor resection. Pathology uh, was consistent with hemangioblastoma grade one, and he had, did have the genetic testing that didn't come back for several months though. And he had a pathogenic variant in VHL gene on chromosome three. We also later learned that his mom had a tumor in her spine and the maternal aunt had a benign brain tumor removed 20 years ago. But he honestly didn't share that with me in the ER. Um, so this is thought to be autosomal dominant case. In terms of his eye course, um, he was following up with Dr. Prensky and received Avastin times two in that right eye, PDT with half fluence times two, as well as some intravitreal steroid for any inflammation. Um, he, his vision started off pretty poor in that eye, 2300, and one year after his diagnosis, it declined a little bit further to 2500. Um, just a little bit of background to tidy things up. So VHL syndrome, just to remind you from medical school, von Hippel's disease is a congenital hereditary condition that results in angiomas of the retina and the optic nerve, so mainly the eye. Now, when it is associated with CNS and other organ involvement, it's called von hippel lindau syndrome. So he meets that diagnosis. Um, it's autosomal dominant or sporadic. And this is really important for us to know because ocular manifestations can and are often uh, first. Half of the patients eventually get retinal angiomas and CNS angiomas though. 
and genetic testing is very accurate. Capillary mangiomas themselves can occur in the periphery near the optic nerve head, as we saw in this case, or anywhere in between. Um, they can also occur at different depths. So endophytic is when they arise from the superficial retina or the optic nerve head and protrude inward toward the vitreous. And when they're peripheral, that's where you get that classic appearance with the feeder artery. They can also be exophytic or arise from the outer retina. And usually you don't see any AV shunting with this. They love to be near the optic nerve head in these cases. And they're often sessile near the optic nerve head and are often misdiagnosed as papilledema. And they can also be within the nerve themselves. So then we remind ourselves, you know, in our differential for unilateral disc edema, it is pretty broad. We consider infectious, inflammatory, infiltrative, compressive, ischemic cases, optic neuropathy and optic neuritis. But we also have to consider the disc tumor uh, that ju juxtapapillary angioma. Uh, because again, these can be mistaken for papilledema. But if you do that FA, you should be able to distinguish that angioma near the optic nerve head. And here's another classic case of that. Also, the FA can identify those very small peripheral retinal angiomas that are hard to see, but can help with the diagnosis. And then just to touch on treatment. So peripheral angiomas are typically treated with laser or cryo and juxtapapillary are notoriously difficult to treat just like this case. Um, you can try PDT and anti-VEGF, but they pretend a poor prognosis. And here's yeah, can, Jamie, can I interrupt for a moment? Go back to the treatment slide there, because I think uh, we were having a really interesting conversation earlier um, with some of our retina specialist panelists about treatment and just, you know, like, how do you decide when to treat? Do you need to treat all of these? Um, I was hoping to get them to chime in. That's yeah. And then maybe Dr. Prensky can touch on his course as well, um, because he's been following the patient over time. Sure. Yeah, I actually see this this gentleman and his brother now, um, although his brother is unaffected. And um, this was one of those, I think, Monday morning gifts from kind of emergency room follow up in the main <laughs> academic medical center clinic. Um, from the get go, sort of discussed with the patient that the uh, the prognosis wasn't uh, particularly favorable. Uh, he has been very re reasonable with everything. I mean, he had, uh, the, I think, something about having a brain tumor resected gave him a pretty decent uh, perspective on things. But uh, from the beginning, the Avacin injections were mainly done to prove that they wouldn't work. Uh, didn't really expect a whole lot from that. And in fact, as these things tend to progress, uh, he he did get worse in spite of the, the Avastin injections. And that's when we, we moved towards uh, PDT. I was a little bit anxious about PDT in this case because it basically is just treating the nerve itself. And uh, literature sort of supports that, that should be okay with half fluence, but depending on who you ask, I would get, if I pulled uh, more experienced colleagues in the community, I would either get a, yeah, it's no problem or I would never do that if my life depended on it. So I never, I didn't get any sort of uh, middle ground. So I wanted to just make sure that, you know, there wasn't really anything else to do. He has done actually anatomically pretty well with the PDT treatments uh, repeated one time. So he had two PDT treatments. Anatomically, his, uh, his uh, cystoid macular edema has resolved largely and the the um, outward appearance, uh, the gross appearance of the uh, angioblastomas look much better. But as you mentioned, he, he does still have the central scotoma, um, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's sort of catching, catching up to date. I mean, it, the OCTs are very impressive. They look quite good, but unfortunately, functionally, it, it hasn't meant uh, much for him.
I am curious, um, Dr. Allard, did you want to comment about, you know, these, these small peripheral angiomas? Do we need to treat those? Do you leave them alone? What do you do? I think just as in coast disease, it never gets better. It'll only get worse. So I absolutely treat all the peripheral angiomas. And frankly, I think they're a little difficult to treat. You have a blood flow through them. So it kind of cools. It's like a radiator. It cools the energy, the heat from the argon laser as you're treating it. So it can take several sessions before you can knock it out and totally ablate it. I do something that I learned from my former partner, Mike Gorin, called fluorescein potentiated argon laser. And what you do is you inject fluorescein dye and almost instantly start lasering the lesion. And the, the green laser, blue laser is better, but green laser will work. Well, the uptake into the vessels, into the angioma will, will be enhanced. And you can actually, it's almost like a, every time you shoot, it's like a neon sign. It just flashes, as you can see it absorbing. And you have about two minutes of, of really intense uh, time to, to treat. And it might take several, several sessions again to do that, maybe monthly. But you wanna do that until the lesion is totally ablated. It, it will get bigger and bigger over time and then it gets almost impossible to treat. That's when you start getting traction detachments and serous detachments. Okay, yeah, thanks Dr. Prensky. Thanks Dr. Eller for, for chiming in about that. Uh, Jamie, what, do you wanna keep going with your last Yeah, question? that was a good lead in. So um, you can see this, you know, in really severe cases, as you see on the left here, a bunch of retinal angiomas with exudate, which is why I think you, you jump on it quickly if you can with laser. Um, and then this is a really severe case on the right with the TRD under silicone oil. So lessons learned. I just wanted to put this in. We have a strong mentor here in Pittsburgh who always tells us that first and foremost, we must become excellent observers. Um, we don't need to know all the possible diagnosis off the bat, but we need to be carefully observing um, for that peripheral retinal angioma, for example, and accurately describe it to our colleagues. And that way we can eventually be uh, excellent ophthalmologists once we learn about those different diagnoses. So it's like developing good habits is just like priming. I like to compare it to priming the land over many years. Um, you want to have the right irrigation, the right soil, the right sun in order to grow the best Florida oranges you possibly can. So be an excellent observer first. And then second, what did I take away from this case? We should maintain a broad differential and keep high suspicion for rare cases. And that way we don't mistakenly jump to conclusions like papilledema. Um, we were able to fortunately nail the diagnosis of VHL and could have potentially saved his life um, if he did have a pheochromocytoma. So um, we could have informed anesthesia and neurosurgery if that were the case. So I always keep a high suspicion for that. And then finally, we're always grateful for our health, especially with you know these neuro-ophthalmology and severe retina cases and it being 2020. So thank you all. Um, I just wanted to thank the panel tonight so thanks for representing Pittsburgh. Um, thank you, Kenny and Dr. Prensky for helping out in the care of this particular patient as well. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning, uh, Kenny Taubenslag, uh, he was, I believe he was the chief resident at Jamie's first year, my second year. He's now a second year vitreo retinal fellow at Vanderbilt. And he's the one who saw this patient in the ED with Jamie. Um, you guys know that, that Dr. Colin Prensky uh, inherited this patient, you know, it's his Monday morning. Um, post post call weekend patient and uh, has lovingly cared for him ever since. So um, I just you know wanted to express appreciation for for you guys as well as uh, Dr. Eller taking care of my my arm patient. So thanks to the the whole team. And uh, Reach Kowalski runs our clinical microbiology lab. Kip Kitchington is uh, actually an ophthalmic uh, virologist who studies VCVs. So um, you know these are guys that have have uh, taught me things about about taking care of these these uh, difficult viral retinitis patients. And thank you all for chiming in. I think we had good representation from Pittsburgh and then also all over the world. So thanks for having us.
That was fantastic. Uh, you know, thank you, uh, Matthew and Ricky, for bringing this together, and 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 Jamie and Ricky for presenting, and and the great panelists. Uh, you know, wonderful conversation. I mean, those I think uh, that attended, we heard great feedback. I mean, there's a real treat uh, to get these uh, two cases to learn so much, and the dialogue and interaction were fantastic. Um, you know, Pitt, Pitt's got a great program, uh, great faculty, and obviously great residents, and we're and we're really proud to collaborate uh, on this round. So thank you for doing that. Uh, internationally, we had a lot of people on on YouTube as well as on Zoom, so it's great to get this, and we'll have this uh, on our on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so I do want to thank everybody uh, for for being involved here. Uh, really uh, enjoyed this, uh, even though it is retina and neuro. You know, it's uh, it was still very very interesting. Um, got a chance to brush up on my knowledge as well, and you know, I think I appreciate Jamie's last couple of slides, which are so important as we think about how we approach our profession. Um, you know, so such wise words and, and again, part of your mentors that you have ingrained that and taught you that so important as well. And uh, these rounds have really brought us all together. The web has brought us together. We're all looking forward to itching to get back and see each other in person. Um, and I owe a lot of people hugs. I owe you know, thousands of people of hugs that have kind of helped me throughout the last many months to kind of get through this together. Uh, we're not through it yet, but, um, but this camaraderie we see together is, is helpful, even though they're, they're small little little snippets to help us through our day. So I can't thank you enough uh, to my esteemed panelists as well who have been here. Um, Dr. Elder, thank you. Dr. Prensky, thank you. Dr. Herrera, thank you very much for being part of this as well. Um, Jamie and Ricky, great, great job. Fantastic presentations. Uh, first class from a content and a style and a communication perspective as well. And we thank our panelists who we kind of picked on a little bit here. Uh, Irfan, thanks for uh, your, your, uh, your feedback. Matthew as well. Patrick, you're looking good, man. Thanks for, for looking good on the screen for us as well. And uh, great to have all the panelists here. We'll be we'll be back, Matthew. What's the what's the plan? A couple of weeks from now, we'll have another round. We'll go at it again, and we'll keep the time for now. Yeah, not not next week, but the next uh, the, the week after. There's the Askers uh, uh, Grand Rounds next week, which Ricky actually mentioned was a good yeah. idea. I think that'd be Askers, great. So. Yeah, Askers is launching a monthly Grand Round. I think we don't want to clash with that. Yeah, yeah we've got to we got to be careful where we where, where we uh, where we tread here. And I noticed, by the way, we had a number of uh, retinal faculty. Uh, from University of Toronto that were here as well, which is kind of nice to see that as well um, from from uh, from our local uh, university. So that's great. Okay, well, listen, thanks. Have a great night. Uh, Don't appreciate you. Get a photo. photo. It's great. Oh, yeah, get a photo. photo. Oh, get a photo. Photo. Let's get one, yeah, let's get a photo here. Okay, everyone's got to <laughs> give their nice, beautiful smiles. All right, hold on. Let me get this set up here. Okay, big smiles. Fantastic. We'll, we'll send this around. Uh, make sure we get it to everybody here. And, and again, really uh, wishing everybody peace and safety and love. And again, keep well. Keep on doing the great work you're doing in Pittsburgh. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. Thank Thanks again. Good night.